Good morning. Welcome. Glad to see each one of you here and those who have joined us online. We're glad that you're here. Uh, just a reminder, if you've got your tithes and offering, there's a vase in the back. Just You can drop it off on your way out this morning. Or if you uh, want to, you can give online going through the church website. There's a place where you can uh, uh, give online, and that is awesome. We appreciate your faithfulness and blessing uh, to our church family. Um, we're going to continue in the book of James this morning. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to James uh, 4. We will get to that in just a moment. But before that, I just wanted to, to share a little story. I, I was trying to think back with um, about getting in a little fight, because that's what this text is going to start out, talking about fighting and quarreling. And I remembered this one fight that I had with my sister. And just one fight I can ever remember having with my sister. And that sounds pretty amazing, probably, but... My sister's nine years older than me, and we didn't live in the same house. She's my half-sister. So um, she lived down south, down here in the, this area, and I lived in Bakersfield. So we, we didn't have a lot of opportunity to have those sibling rivalries that others do. But I do remember one. Uh, I was pretty young, and, and we were, were about to play the board game Sorry. And uh, as we're playing, I wanted to be blue. At least how I remember the story. I wanted to be blue, but so did her friend. And But I was insistent on blue and my sister was insistent that her friend gets to be the blue and I as being a little kid got all bent out of shape and started yelling or whatever ran to the room and jumped on the bed and was just throwing a little temper tantrum as little kids will do because I wanted to have the blue because it makes such a big difference in the game of sorry which is all a luck game anyway right no no strategy no nothing just pick up the card and move that many spaces well, then she came into the room, and, and as I remember it, telling me, like, okay, you can be the blue or whatever. I don't remember, but I just remember I just sat up and turned and, like, threw a punch at her because I was a little brother. <clears throat> and then she yelled something or what I don't remember, and, and she left the room, and, and that's all I remember of the story. But what the point of the story is, what caused that was selfishness, specifically my selfishness. Me wanting to have what I wanted, and her wanting her friend, or her, I'm not sure what that part of the story was, wanting the same thing, and there was selfishness. But she gave up her selfishness when she came to say, hey, just come back, it'll be okay, you can have the blue, whatever. But I continued to be selfish and to be mad and to quarrel and to fight and to, to throw a punch at her. I don't even remember if I hit her or what happened for sure. But that's the way fighting, arguing, quarreling usually goes. I mean, just take a moment and think about it in your own life, uh, the last quarrel or argument or fight that you had uh, with somebody. And I don't necessarily mean a physical knockdown struggle fight, but just uh, some sort of disagreement. It's often because of one's selfishness. Maybe not yours. It could be the person you're fighting with. Um, their own want, not wanting to give in to what they think is right or to do it the way you want to do it, but they want to do it the way they want to do it. And it's, it's just whoever that might be. And it starts young. For those of you who are parents, how many times did you get in fights, arguments, displeasure, frustration with your child just because they wouldn't keep their shoes on in the car? They just wanted to pop those things off and throw them. Or they didn't want to put their shoes on to leave. Why are you laughing, Adeline? <laughs> That's every kid. Um, I think it's every kid. There's these little things, and, and it's, but why did their self, I want your shoes on, they want it off. Now, one may be right and the other one wrong sometimes, but often these things come up over our own selfishness. And what we're learning in James today is that we shouldn't be selfish. And he's going to get, again, he's going to get into what causes our selfishness. Let's pray and uh, let's ask God to open our hearts and minds as we dive into the text this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come with an open hearts to hear from you. And Lord, that we would um, be open to luck and recognize our own selfishness and things that we might have that we need to, to give up and turn over to you and uh, to trust in you and to follow you. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for being here with us today. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So chapter 4, verse 1 of James starts out right away. What causes fights and quarrels among you? So he's asking that question. And he just, he just answers it. 
Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Or as I'm calling your selfish desires. The desires that battle within you. The things that are happening between you and the other people in your church family. Remember, he's writing to Christians around the, the, that have spread out around the known world at the time. And there's these, these disunities, these divisions, these things happening. And he's calling them back to, to unity, but he's saying, hey, what's causing it? Isn't it your selfishness? Isn't it your own desires? And I want to point out a little theme that's happening here. Again, we pointed it out last week, but I, I just think this is the point for this series that we need to get. I want us to remember James 1.14, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires. Their own selfish evil desires. I'll add the word selfish there. In chapter 3, James addressed controlling the tongue. And as we talked about controlling the tongue, that, that, that what comes out of the mouth, what comes out of our actions, comes from what's really within, deep within us. And then James 3.14, But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it and deny the truth. So this, this thing in your heart. And there's the theme. We see this, this whole thing is about our heart. Your evil desires. Your, and even in here, your own, um, your own desire within you. So earlier, the temptation one was your evil desires. Here it's your desires. And, and what's going to flow out of you is what's in your heart. It's a heart issue. Selfishness and what's going on in us is a heart issue. And God wants to work on our heart. James is letting us know you want to have that right relationship. You've come to faith in Jesus. You've come to believe what He did on the cross. And, and the, your actions and your heart needs to be transformed to follow your belief so that those beliefs show, or sorry, those actions show your belief. But it has to do with our hearts. It's a heart issue. Everything's a heart issue. Verse 2, you desire, but you do not have. So you kill, you covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. So we don't know if he meant literally that these people were killing one another. Probably not. Probably an exaggeration to make a point. You're really mistreating each other. You're really being bad to each other. You're really not helping each other out. And it's because of your own selfishness, your own desires. And, and because you want what you want, you're going to do what it is to get it. And that's not the way we are to live our life as, as followers of Christ. Christ was the ultimate example of giving up His life for other people. He is the ultimate example of not being selfish. And that's what we are being called to. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So, obviously there's some sort of situation going on here. And at the end of it, that, the verse prior to this, he says, hey, you don't have because you don't ask God. You don't have those things because you're... you're, you're, you're heart and the next one is not lined up you're, when you do ask God you're coming with wrong motives you're coming because of what your pleasures what you can get out what will be best you think would be best for you and so this, this again it's about your heart even when your prayer the answers to your prayers are not there because your heart is not lined up with God's heart verse 5 Sorry, verse 4. You adulterous people, don't you know that the friendship with the world means enmity with God, against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Now, he calls them adulterous people, not necessarily because they're committing adultery and cheating on their spouses. Possibly, probably some of them are doing that. But he's talking to the group as a whole, and he's saying, look, this, this is, you adulterous, you're, you're committing adultery against God. When you're living your own selfish way, doing your things the way you want to, trying to get what you want, trying to manipulate, trying to get stuff that other people have from them, and, and doing all these sorts of things. When you're in that situation, you're, you're breaking your vows with God. You're promised to follow Him. You're promised to love Him. You're breaking those out. So He's addressing, look, when you are doing the things selfishly, you're doing things your way, not God's way. When you're following that path, you're committing adultery against God. So it's 
So he's like, you adulterers. You adulterers. <clears throat> you're breaking your ways against God. And when you and you're you're joining things with and becoming friends with the world. Now James isn't talking about, oh, you have friends who aren't believers, and that's wrong. That's not what he's saying here. Because otherwise, if we didn't make friends, if we didn't interact with people who did not know who Jesus was, how would we share it with them? So we are to have this relationship with them. What he's talking about is, is this friendship with the world is participating in the sinful things of the world. The des- those evil desires that we have, those selfish desires that we have that are ungodly, that are what we think will bring us um, wonderful gratific- gratif- gratification. It's doing the things our way. When we, we've partnered in doing sinfulness, when we're doing those things, when we have joined in that, we're becoming enemies of God. You're either on his side or not on his side. You can't play both ways. I remember I was a kid. We tried to we'd play um, uh, football in the front yard out in the grass. And, they, and sometimes we wouldn't have enough people. Right? Sometimes we just wouldn't have enough people. It would be an odd number. So someone would say, I'll be full-time quarterback. Which meant I would play on both teams as the quarterback. Which in a kid's game in the front yard works fine. But could you imagine at the Super Bowl, Cindy, if Patrick McCombs would have said, you know what, I'm going to be full-time quarterback. I'm going to play quarterback for both teams. How would that go? How would the management, the team paying him like that? Awesome. <laughs> they would not deal with that. You can't do that. And God's like, hey, you're on my team. You're going to play on my team, and I, I need you to completely play on my team. Or what if just in another scenario, like in basketball, the guy says, I'm only going to play offense. Because I, like, I have some good friends on that team, and I, I want to see them do good too, so I'm just going to let them score or set back and not try very hard. It wouldn't go very far with the coach. You'd get benched. You've got to be all in for your team. You've got to be all in for your team. Um... <clears throat> When I went through orientation at FedEx, you know what they told us? You can have a second job as long as it's not with UPS, Amazon. Why? Because those are the conflict of interest. It's the, they, we, I'm fine here at the church, but don't go to UPS. Don't go to Amazon. Don't go to the competitors. Why? They, as far as dealing with packaging, they, need, they want all of us committed there. God wants all of you. He wants your whole heart. He doesn't just want part of it. He doesn't just want Sunday or Wednesday or that time that you take during the day, but then the rest of the day is just yours. He wants your whole day. That doesn't mean you have to sit in prayer on your knees and in your Bible and never looking around. No. But He's part of it. And when you are about your day, that you're doing things to bless and help other people. <clears throat> you're doing things that will show love to one another. You're, you're doing the things that is better for you. Because that's how God's economy works. You obey Him, but it blesses you. It's just the way it is. Verse 5. <clears throat> or do you think Scripture says without reason that He jealously longs for the Spirit He has caused to dwell in us? Um, but he gives us jealous. God wants all of us just as any of us want our spouse to just be with all to give all of them we don't want to share them he wants all of us he paid a big price to have all of us And he wants all of us. Verse 6, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. James is quoting Proverbs 3.34 here. When he says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. He's, he's, 
as we humble ourselves and we submit our selfishness to God and, and stop those things or, or give up more of our time to spend more time with Him. Because it's not always just giving up bad and negative time. Sometimes it's to say, hey, I'm going to not do this thing to spend more time focused on ministering or to do this for God or do this for someone else as though I'm doing it for God. Um, and, and to submit and to get rid of the things we want, it's a humbling thing. To surrender to God, it's a humbling thing. And for those who continue to humble themselves before God, He gives us more and more grace. Grace is this free gift. It's something you can't earn. See, so again, James is pointing it out. Like the most of this book, if you just kind of read it without thinking it through and processing it, it just kind of looks like it's, he's a works. Do this, do this, and God will love you. God will bless you. Do, do this and, and do this so God will do this. But that's, that's not his point. There's these little nuggets that are out here. When we humble ourselves before him and we live for him, and the more we do that, the more grace, the more of his free gift that he gives to us. It's not an earning thing, but God recognizing that we are loving him and that, we, that he died for us. And so he pours out his grace on those who are willing to accept his grace, who believe in him, who trust in him, who follow him. I guess pa, I, I kind of even confused myself there a little bit. So I want to see if I can say that clear. For those who truly love God and believe in Him and live for Him, He pours out His grace. And He continues to get pour out His grace and His grace will cover us. Now those who have not been living for Him, have been living selfishness, but they recognize the work He did on the cross and they humble themselves and say, forgive me for the way I've lived. He gives it to them. Not by because they started to come to church a lot or they started praying more. Or they gave so much money to the church or to homeless or to whatever it might be. Not because of any of those things, but because they said, I believe in you and I submit and humble myself to you. He continues to pour out his grace on those. Verse 7, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And so right after that, that submit, that humble yourself, that submit. And this is the first verse of several. He goes along the line here of, of, of giving us things on how to live less selfishly. And it starts with, submit yourself then to God and then resist the devil. Resist those selfish things. Resist those temptations. Resist those things that try to lure us away from God. And we resist those things and He will flee. He will stop. doesn't mean he won't return. It doesn't mean he won't try again. We've got to keep our guard up. See, in the Gospels and specifically in Luke, it tells a story about Jesus resisting the devil. Three different times the devil comes up to him while he's out in the wilderness doing a, a prayer and fasting time as he begins his ministry. And three different times the devil tries to get him to, to do something that is, would be selfish outside of God's will for him. And all three times Jesus quotes scriptures and denies him. And then it tells us that the devil left him. He fled him. But it did say he would come back in a oppor more opportune time. And that's true for us as well. We need to keep submitting. And he'll go away. And he'll go away from season. And we'll start feeling pretty good and feeling strong and feeling healthy. And we'll let our guard down. And then when he sees our guard down, and we're, he'll start slipping back in there. He's going to keep trying. But we've got to keep resisting. And turning away. And going the other way. And, he, and when he comes back, we're ready for him. And we resist again. He then tells us in verse 8, Come near to God, and he'll come near to you. There's a change of focus. Instead of focusing and trying to get all those selfish desires and do the selfish things we want, we focus on God and say, how do I get more of God? And we, we jump into our life of following Him and leaving obedience to Him and reading His Word and talking to Him and praying and, and worshiping and singing songs and, and finding all the things that we can give Him thanks and praise for. 
And we just we focus on Him. And as we focus on Him, we draw nearer to Him. Verse 7. Sorry, verse 8. Um, the next part of verse 8. Wash your hands, you sinners. Wash in your hands. Say, hey, I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore. I've, I've been doing things unclean. It's a, it's a symbolic thing. Say, hey, wash your hands of that. Get, 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 clean yourself up. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Purifying our heart. Again, there's their, that heart theme. Working on doing the things to change our heart. To change what our desires are. To change what will flow out of us. Verse 9, Grieve, mourn, and well. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Now this sounds a little bit confusing when you come off of verse 1, or or chapter 1, where he says, Consider it pure joy. When things are rough around you, when things are bad, when, when, when trouble comes your way. But there's a difference here. When he's saying consider it pure joy, consider it pure joy when you're living right before the Lord and people attack you because of that. Things are going bad because of your faith, because you're doing the things the right way. Here he's saying grieve, mourn, and well because you're not doing the right things. You're selfish. You're doing the things that you want to do, not what God wants you to do. You know what's right. You know what's wrong. And you choose to do what you want versus what God wants. And you should recognize that. And as you recognize that, you should grieve your poor decisions. You should mourn that you aren't doing the right thing. And you should well and cry out that I'm sorry that I, this is wrong and I shouldn't do that. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Because sometimes we find enjoyment in that selfishness. That's why, like, if it wasn't fun, if it wasn't exciting, we wouldn't be drawn to those things. Those wouldn't be our selfish desires. But let's be honest. There is some, some joy and fun and some things that come out of sinfulness and that, that in the moment we enjoy, but maybe afterwards don't. Regret comes in. And, and so James is letting us know, hey, stop doing that. Quit laughing and mourn that you made those decisions. Don't be joyful about those decisions. Find, be, be repentive. Humble yourself before the Lord. Verse 10. And He will lift you up. See, in selfishness, we're always trying to build ourselves up. We're trying to do things that make us look good. We're trying to do things that makes us feel good. And here he's saying, hey, humble yourself before God. Live what you believe. Be humble before Him and let Him lift you up. Let Him recognize you. Let Him bless you. And that humbleness is a a repentiveness. It's a humble. It's falling on your knees before God. Say, God, I've tried to do it my way. I've been doing it this way. I've had this attitude. I've had this um, whatever. And it's just not really working out right. I'm going to humbly submit that to you. And then we'll get into verse 11. It seems like he, he just shifts directions here. And in the way he did, we could do a whole sermon on verse 11 and 12. Um, But I I think it's really connected back to the beginning. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you who are... who, But you... Who are you to judge your neighbor? So I think he's connecting it back to the quarreling and fighting. Because I can imagine if I'm slandering someone in this room, that's going to cause some quarreling. Because you're going to defend yourself. If I start judging you and passing judgment, whether it's right judgment or wrong judgment, it's not our place. It is our place to say, hey, you know what? Is that the right thing? And God's told us to do this. There is a right place of of coming along each other and encouraging and pushing us into the correct direction. But to just pass, it causes quarreling. It causes fighting. 
And why would we slander someone? Why would we judge someone in that way? It would be usually to make ourselves look better, to build ourselves up. But that's not humble. That's not living the way Christ called us to live. And when we do this, we're taking God's position. God is to be the judge. God is the one who's supposed to do those things. We're to leave it up to God. We are not to judge our neighbor in this condemning way. Like I said, yes, we see a brother in Christ, someone doing what we do, or who's made the same commitment we have, we tell them, hey, you know what the word says about that? How, how can I help you do better? Or this and that. We, we can point it out. We can work and, and help each other grow. Um, but there's, there's a difference in that and judging someone and just kind of casting them out, casting them aside and kicking them while they're down and things like that. We need to help one another. So this morning I want to challenge you to do something this week. Um, I want you to take this text and reread it several times even throughout the week. Specific, specifically beginning at verse 7 through uh, 10. Where I really think this is a list of things that as we pray as we and read the Word and ask God to point out what are some areas maybe we could work on. Maybe there's some just slight selfishness in some of these areas that we don't really recognize because it's not way out there. It's not huge, but it's just, it's just bubbling there. And pray about it and see what God might have you do. See, He may point out to you that you really need to submit or humble yourself before Him. Maybe there's a pride, a conceit, a, um, a, I'm, I'm doing good on my own here, or um, even a, a judgment about I, I, oh, I'm doing better than they are. Look at, I'm whatever. Maybe He'll point out some selfish desires. Maybe there's just some things going on in your mind and your thought process and, and that are really just about your own selfishness versus what God has and what's best for you. Or your covetousness, just coveting, wanting that just because someone else has it and, and you would like to have that too, recognition, or maybe it's a, a, a thing that you just like to possess. Maybe it's your covet, you want it. Maybe it's a type of relationship that you see other people have and you want to have that same and you're just, it's a covetousness and, and a hurtful thing to you. Maybe there's some friendships with the world that you have that just need to stop. And as I said earlier, I think it's specifically referring to those decisions, those behaviors just that are not necessarily people. However, if it's people in your life that tempt you to do those things, sometimes it means those people too. Because those people, even as we heard in the prayer request this morning, it's, it's being around the wrong crowd, the wrong group of people. The next three, resist the devil. Resist. When those, when those thoughts, those temptations, remember, I've humbled myself. I'm not doing that. And we're going to resist until the devil flees. Come near to God and wash your hands or repent. Grieve, mourn well. All of those things are about repenting. All of those three things, I think, are part of ways we come closer to God. Those are the things we start to change our heart. When we resist the devil, when we resist those sinful things, when we resist those um, selfish desires, when we resist those things and put God first, that's going to draw us closer to God. That's going to help us come near to God. Um, when we repent and, and wash our hands and stop those things, we're, we're going to come near to God because our focus is there. And when we stop and we do those, we, we focus on prayer and talking to God and, and communing with Him throughout the day. There's many times throughout my day when I'm working at, in a trailer pulling boxes off and, and there's no one else in that trailer with me, 
that it just, I'll talk to God. Just, it's part of trying to stay near to Him and focused on Him and, and keeping my thoughts on Him. Going about those things in the day that are, I'm able to do that. Now, there's other times in the day where it takes my attention and I'm focused and, and it, I can't pray when I'm doing those things. But as I'm driving, as I'm, it's, it's learning to have that, I want to be near you and talk with you and interact with you all the time. And then don't slander and don't judge, we found in verse 11 and 12. Are there things, am I slandering people? Am I talking about people when I shouldn't be? Even if it's real, true stuff, not made up gossip, not just stuff made up to hurt someone's reputation, but, but is it doing something that's going to help them or, or, or tear them down? Maybe there's something in you that God will point out and say, hey, don't do that. Or maybe it's judging people. And he points that out. Then take the steps to change that. But as we implement any of these things in our life, any of these things that he points out, we're starting to move towards being less selfish. Our goal is to not be selfish. And then maybe as you read that list and you, you're praying through that, you're going, man, I, I kind of trouble with slander and judging and also, I've got some dirty hands that need to be washed, and I haven't been trying to draw near to God. And, and all of a sudden, it's like, I'm doing everything on this list. I'm going to try to stop. You know what? Start with one or two. Start with one or two. Maybe the most offensive or the strongest one, whatever. Try to figure out what. And then work on all of them and develop and grow until we don't have those selfish desires. See, our mission as a church, a mission as believers, mission as followers of Christ, is to fulfill the Great Commission. To go and make disciples. How do we go and make disciples if first our heart is not lined up with God? We, we probably won't even want to. But if we're selfish, because you know what, having that conversation, it can be hard, it can be embarrassing, it can be, but it, and if we're just being selfish, it can it can be hard to go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I've taught you. If we're being selfish, it's going to be hard to teach and help people grow in the Lord if we're being selfish. We don't want to give up the time to spend with someone to help them to grow and to develop. God wants us, first of all, He wants all of our heart because He was us. And He wants us to be fully committed to Him. And He knows that's what's best for us. And He wants all of our heart so that He can use us the best to reach the people around us. And it starts with our heart being lined up with His. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your heart. Your heart was so committed to us that you created us. And yet when we messed up and we failed and we went our own way, you continued to pursue after people and to create a way for them to have communion with you, to be in relationship with you, to be reconciled to you. Uh, and you even went to the extreme of the cross to send Jesus to come and die for us. Because you were totally committed. Your heart is all in and and how could you not be? Because it's you who is pure and perfect and holy. And, and you provided a way. But Lord, it's not easy for us. We, we get so distracted so easily. And so Lord, we come this morning saying we want you to be in us. We want our heart to be lined up with your heart. We want the things that you want for us. And so Lord, help us to be to self-disciplined and focused on you to to do the things you want us to do, to change the things that need to change, to draw nearer to you. Lord, the safest place to be is closest to you. So Lord, help us to get there. Fill us with your spirit. Empower us to do these things so that we can be your witness, so we can help other people be reconciled to you, so that they too can learn to not be selfish. 
Lord, we thank you that you will do this for us. You will help us. You will guide us. You will walk with us. You will pour out your grace as you have with your son on the cross. And we say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Hope to see you back on Wednesday night as we discuss episode two of The Chosen, season two.